Good morning and happy Monday. Hope everyone's doing great after a long weekend, a Thanksgiving weekend in the US. Well, today's topic, we are going to be talking about vitamin D. We all know that vitamin D, we can get it from the sunlight. And, and but you know, we are going to be talking about the supplementation, if we need supplementation. So uh, joining me would be Dr. Monty. Dr. Monty will be joining me from um, Lucin, uh, you know, from the East Coast right now. He is author of a book that's called Tapestry of Health, which I'm gonna share with all of you right now. And I am just waiting for him to join me so that we can start talking about, um, let's see, just me. And he is um, also founding director and see, there you go. Good morning, Dr. Monty. How are you? Good morning. Such a pleasure to be with you today. Yes, yes. Well, happy Monday after a long Thanksgiving weekend. So I'm super excited. Likewise. Yeah. Well, I was just telling our viewers that, um, you know, we are going to be talking about vitamin D, but I wanted to give a brief intro about yourself. You know, Dr. Monty is a co-author of a new book called, I just want to show all of our viewers, called Tapestry of Health. And, and uh, you know, he's also founding director of Marcus Institute of Integrative Health. The whole point of this book is that he coaches us. He really tells all of us a step-by-step -step plan of, of really integrating, you know, nutrition and lifestyle practice so that we can all live a healthier life. So now we'll be talking about vitamin D. But before I start that, Dr. Monty, would you like to add a little bit more about yourself? Well, this is a very exciting time, I think, for integrative medicine, and I appreciate all that people like you do to get the word out about what we're doing in integrative health and integrative medicine. It's just so important. And, you know, at Thomas Jefferson University, where I work, we created in the past year the first ever department of integrative medicine and nutritional sciences at the medical school. So oh. we now sit alongside with dermatology, OBGYN, medicine, surgery, and now integrative medicine, which is a big step forward and something that we're just so happy about. It's one of the reasons we wrote the book, my partner Anthony Bazan and I, because we wanted to share with the rest of the, the world what we're doing in integrative mm -hmm. medicine, how we're defining it, how we're moving forward, and loving to partner with people like you. No, I think it's amazing. Most of the doctors I, we have talked to in the past, and they all tell us that how in medical schools nutrition um, is not being taught. You know, uh, it's a two-week course, and everyone says, "Oh, that's the time to relax and say, okay, now I can have a drink and relax before I go to the, you know, my other <laughs> more strenuous classes, right? But nutrition is so important, and that's what you've outlined, and that's what you're doing is amazing because nutrition, food, is a fundamental thing, and we are looking at it right now, what's happening in COVID, right? Yes, it's, nutrition is so important. It's so underrepresented in medical school curriculum right now, and that's yeah. one of the reasons that we've taken the stance that we have in, and to make the strides that we have in medical education, mm -hmm. research, uh, doing nutrient-based uh, research protocols, some of which we talk about in the book, because, I mean, people aren't aware of what the latest evidence is, but many doctors aren't. Um, you know, we, we sort of live in a disease-focused model where, you know, yeah. my colleagues in uh, primary care, they do a great job, but really they're putting out fires all day. They have you know, seven minutes for an appointment, and mm -hmm. they have to decide, do you have a raging strep throat that needs an antibiotic? Do you need to go to the hospital? Does this person need to do? And so it makes it very difficult for people out there on the front line to focus on wellness-oriented strategies. How do you optimize health? How do you increase your resilience and better weather the storm during a time like this, during a time like COVID? And what is the best information? What is the, the, the most cutting edge evidence-based strategies out there? And so that's why we decided to take this big academic step forward, creating a department, creating an institute, and also writing a book. I, I think it's amazing. And <clears throat> I, I did read, um, I, I haven't finished the entire book, but I did read the evidence part of it. And it's fascinating how you've mapped the brain functions, you know, the brain, the mapping of the brain after, uh, you know, nutrition, after meditation and all the things. And that's what I think as a user, all of us users need, um, you know, validation from MD and the evidence, showing the evidence that all of this really works. You know, we're very fortunate that 
we have the brain imaging capabilities that we have yeah. as part of being the Marcus Institute, the Marcus Foundation yeah. helped us to purchase the most cutting edge equipment. So we have an integrated PET, positron emission tomography MRI scanner so that we can get the best snapshot of anatomy, but then also the best look at functionality with functional MRI and PET imaging. And then combining all of those really gives you something unique. And that's why we have those pre post brain scans in the book, mm -hmm. but those are part of published clinical trials that we've done to show the brain yeah. and how it functions actually yeah. changes when you do these integrative things that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I want to show all our viewers, you know, and we'll be putting it up there uh, with your permission on Insta Live, and because yes. I really want people to know, you know, the actual evidence, the, you know, the science behind it. So, well, now to our topic of vitamin D. So let's talk about vitamin D. Um, what are the normal levels? You know, we all get vitamin D from the sunlight. Uh, you know, I'm in California, the sun, sunshine is always there. But, but what exactly uh, are the normal levels of, you know, of vitamin D in, in all of our bodies? Right, so there's a normal range that is out there for standard laboratories and standard uh, medicine of, of 30 to 100. The problem with 30 is that it's still too low. And okay. the problem with most people is that their levels are going to be low. As we get into adulthood and then those middle decades of life, those levels seem to drop off, except for people who really are spending a lot of time outside. But the thing with spending a lot of time outside is that's a lot of time outside without sunblock. Yeah. Because the sunblock then interferes with the manufacturing of the vitamin D. And, you know, it's a, it's a difficult balance because mm -hmm. we've sort of destroyed the ozone layer with pollution, which increases skin cancer risk if we yeah. get too much sun exposure with those UV rays. And so it's a, it's a bit of a balance. How much um, unprotected sun do you get versus not? And most people just don't get enough to have yeah. sufficient vitamin D levels. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get enough vitamin D from the diet. It isn't really the primary way humans get their vitamin D. There is some vitamin D in some sources, um, yeah. some, some aquatic sources like sardines and things like that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, it's really a sunlight thing for most people, um, with the exception of a few subgroups. And so what do we do about that? It's one of those handful of supplements that I actually usually supplement for myself okay. and for people that I'm working with. Yeah. Because the levels are often just, when we look at them and we look at them, they're low. And then another challenge that a lot of people have is increasingly insurance companies are giving people a problem with mm -hmm. covering the vitamin D level, which is, preposterous in some ways, because we know how important vitamin D is yes. for all function, including immune function. Here we are in a pandemic. And yeah. actually, we need a sufficient amount of vitamin D. And there have been small, but still some evidence showing that people who are very deficient in vitamin D have a harder time getting over an illness like COVID and other respiratory diseases. And so we don't want to take mega doses of anything, but we want yeah. sufficient amounts. Yeah. And you know, different people require different amounts to get a sufficient blood level. I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. I can give somebody a thousand units a day and they're perfectly fine. But then mm -hmm. another person on a thousand units a day, they're still too low and I might have to make it two or even 5,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. It's an, it's, but it's a very important nutrient to be thinking about. And for those of you who aren't in beautiful California like you, <laughs> who, aren't, who aren't getting much uh, exposure to sunlight, it's one of the things I think about adding a little bit in terms of supplementation. Sure, sure. So, and so supplement like, do you recommend taking a capsule or, or do you recommend like a, a simple uh, capsule? That yeah, the capsules are fine. Um, okay. I like the capsule um, and for most people it absorbs well enough. This also raises another question of do we uh, use it vitamin D in isolation or do yeah. we like the combined ones with vitamin K? Yeah, and yeah. I do like those because the vitamin K also plays a role in the vitamin D absorption. So okay. um, there's a, in our institute, we have pure vitamin D because some people, that vitamin K, D combination isn't quite enough. And I still need to add a little vitamin D to get the levels up there. Yeah. And so uh, we, you know, we usually 
kind of flip between the two. But for the average person out there, I like the, the supplements that combine the K and the D. Oh, K and D, both. Yeah, and, because the and K then, helps with the absorption and metabolism of the D. Yeah, and that's why I asked you, because the absorption, you need the absorption. Some doctors, they recommend the liquid form of other things, you know, the yeah. herbs and some of the other things. So, yeah. The liquid form is fine, too. And every once in a blue moon, I have a patient that really requires that in order to get yeah. the level up there, no matter what else I combine it with. Yeah, yeah. So, so lot, I mean, all these supplements are available, right, you know, off the shelf from Costco or some of these. I mean, do you think people, like normal people like you and me, I mean, you're a doctor, of course, like people like us, should uh, uh, talk to a doctor before we take these supplements or we just, uh, okay, so someone is asking, what dose do you recommend daily? That's the question yeah. someone is asking. Yeah, I, so I usually follow blood levels. For someone nice. that has a sense that they're low, and because they're not getting any sunlight, they, they don't have the immediate opportunity to get the blood level. Then I usually say about a thousand units a day will, will, will be very good for most people. Um, I think that it is wise to give the advice to talk to your doctor. I mean, when you go and see your doctor, ask for the vitamin D levels so you know what it is and you know where you are. Some people are very surprised that they're extremely low they might even need a prescription level of vitamin D to get that level up there, and then they take it supplementally. So it's one of those things that pay attention to it. And even the kind of more conventional medical doctors know how to manage a low vitamin D level. Yeah. So do you recommend getting blood tests done on a regular basis to kind of see, uh, you know, what we are deficient with a normal person so that, you know, we can at least manage you know those deficiencies of, of yeah there's some things that there just isn't a good measurement for so yeah. as we enter for example this we're already in a pandemic and now we're entering cold and flu season yeah another one that i get a lot of questions about is vitamin c for example where there's not really a reliable blood test to say well yeah, this is yeah. what your your vitamin c levels are because it's very tightly regulated in the body. Yeah. However, I think it's very important during times like this for sufficient immune function to be taking in enough vitamin D. And you know, if you're listening, if you're gonna yeah. eat the foods required, yeah. and that's always first and foremost for us, yeah. or you might need to sort of add a little bit of vitamin C. But I think that getting in enough citrus fruits, red peppers, things that are high in vitamin C during this time of year, is very important. I, I'm like a fan of lemon uh, yeah. because I like to, and, and for those of you who are, are chefs or like to cook um, yeah. and you like to zest things, orange and lemon, you know, the, the, the peel actually has a good amount of vitamin C. So you can put yeah. zest in things. You have the yeah. juice, you have the whole fruit. And I yeah. love uh, lemon and olive oil as a salad dressing because mm -hmm. it actually is a very nutritive, good way to go for, for salad. So thinking about how you add that lemon and citrus throughout okay. your day and throughout your diet with tea, a, a great thing to do, add some lemon and get some of the vitamin C that way. So yeah. thinking about natural ways of adding the vitamin C is really first and foremost. Sure, sure. And the tea you mentioned, is there any specific, like there's a lot of research on green tea, but even black tea also has the same kind of compounds. I mean, so is this particular type of tea that, the, that you would say, or just any tea and sip it slowly on a daily, you know, every, the whole throughout the day? Yes. So I say first and foremost for tea, one that you like so that you'll drink it. Um, <laughs> and I think that it's, um, a, you know, there's, there's data to support different types of tea having yeah. different types of polyphenols and antioxidant properties to them. The strongest support is with green tea. Yeah. Um, but if you don't like green tea, you're not gonna drink it. But if there is a way to enjoy the green tea with some lemon and some other things you might add to it to make it more nutritive, great. The other thing that I think about when I'm kind of making a warm something during these mm -hmm. cooler months, because we wanna be warming the body even when you yeah. live in California, because it still gets a little brisker and a little cooler and you mm -hmm. want to warm the body, is to also think about adding things like turmeric if it's yes. something that's available to you. Mm -hmm. And it is for most people because it's so anti-inflammatory. 
And mm -hmm. you need that anti-inflammatory property right now as we get into those cooler months. So, so turmeric would be, um, yeah, you know, I'm originally from India, so turmeric has been in the curries, right? So, so I grew up with that, putting the turmeric in the curries, every, pretty much not every veg, uh, dish. But for a lot of people, you know, who are not used to eating curries, uh, how would you uh, recommend taking turmeric? Should they take some capsules or should they uh, incorporate into like a cure? They can take the capsules, but you, and, and that's, there's value to that. But the fresh yeah. turmeric, when you can get it, I'm still a fan of it. Now, people might know, not know how to integrate it into curry like you. I don't. I just love eating your food, yeah. but I don't know how to make it. Um, and so, um, but, you know, those um, very fine graters that you use for zesting, you can yeah. use that um, along, and you can do that with ginger and put that okay. in your hot tea. Uh, also, the thing with fresh turmeric that I like to do is I often make a smoothie in the morning as my breakfast or it could yeah. be at lunch and a green smoothie where I'm like adding some of those living green vegetables and the turmeric actually along with other things it it's an acquired taste but it's actually a very pleasant taste I think if you try it it's just has such great value to give it a mm -hmm. try and see if there's a way that you can incorporate that fresh turmeric into your um, warm beverage or even your uh, cold smoothie. Yeah, so like a turmeric root that that um, yeah. that you get, then peel yeah. it off like a ginger. It's, a, it's sort of like looks like a ginger, but it's a little bit smaller. And right. then you cut it, and then you kind of um, uh, blend it. Right, what you're suggesting right. is with you some. It, um, you can put it in your tea, your your tea ball, the the little metal yeah. thing. You yeah. can um, blend it in your smoothie, but. It, again, the, the capsules are fine, but when you can get something raw yeah. from nature, it's always better. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What other things? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, from uh, I, I know we have these are really short sessions uh, uh, we try to do. But what other things would you recommend? Like just a simple daily regimen in today's day and times. So like you, we talked about turmeric. You know, we talked about the tea. We talk about the smoothies. Uh, what about eating, like you know, like lunch and dinner? Is there special something that we should more focus on? Yes. Did One you... thing is that people are home more, and people are stressed more, and yeah. this causes people to um, comfort eat. And I, I think that we have to think about when we're eating, and yeah. to give our metabolism a break once we get into the evening hours. Okay. Okay. to keep decreasing, decreasing, and then nothing. It, ideally, you would only have some water or um, a warm beverage uh, close to bedtime. Okay. And let your body just heal throughout the night. A 12-hour period is actually ideal. And okay. um, I would say that it's also in keeping with uh, Ayurveda as well. To yes. have the evening sort of diminish the amount of food that you take in because People have flipped that around, many people that I talk to, because they're home, they're uncertain, they're kind of grabbing food. And it's yeah. a matter of, for many people, just reminding yourself, just being yeah. conscious about it again. It's time to sort of snap back into a mode of being self-nurturing, self-caring, taking a break for the day when uh, you're working from home, not letting home and work blend too much once you get into those evening hours so you can step mm -hmm. away from it connect mm -hmm. with people in a different way, take a walk outside, breathe. These yeah. things are very important to keep resetting the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And what's critical here is doing everything possible to have a good night's sleep. I because see. Because if we don't yeah. pay attention to what we're consuming late at night, yeah. if we don't pay attention to the light in our bedroom and all these other things that are distractions, we won't yeah. have restful sleep and we need it for our immune resilience right now during these times. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, it's interesting, you know, like all of us for that matter, like especially in the U.S., right? We are, li we are living in a culture where the uh, lunch is a go, right? You know, uh, you just grab and go. <laughs> you know, we have, uh, most of us have that culture. And dinner is a time, okay, now I, we can relax and, oh, I can have a drink. And so to having, <laughs> having, how do you shift that whole paradigm? Because it's like culturally, you know, what you're saying is, you know, Ayurveda say, says the same thing, exactly the same thing. And we've been talking a lot about Ayurveda, but how do you shift that entire paradigm of a culture from having a, 
heavier meal uh, during the day and, and having a lighter meal at night when all of us are running, uh, you know, uh, right. during the day. That's what I feel. Yeah, issue. it's absolutely um, an issue. Yeah. I think that it also just requires this thoughtfulness that we're talking about, but also take steps that feel reasonable. So maybe you can start to shift dinner time earlier. If yeah. it was eight o'clock, maybe it can become seven and even 6.30. Yeah. So that there's, again, space between when you're done eating and when you go to bed. Yeah. And making the transition at dinner time to yeah. some lighter options, to yeah. some plant-based options. Yeah. Those heavy meat meals that some people like to eat at night they're not your friend, especially yeah. in the evening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, someone is uh, commenting, you're absolutely right. Someone else asked a question, is there a problem? Well, we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, lighter meals at dinner time, sort of like a concept of intermittent fasting, right? And giving uh, our, giving our uh, gut, a, you know, our stomach a break for 12 hours. So that, that's what we were talking about. Any questions, any other feedback, you're welcome to uh, put it in the chat uh, here. Um, I know there are quite a few people have logged in. So um, you're welcome to put any feedback right here or ask questions also. Um, anything else you would like to add, Dr. Monty, before we wrap up? I, uh, I'll just, I'll just uh, underscore that last concept you mentioned, the, the, the intermittent feeding. In Intermittent and fasting. It, it, people call it intermittent fasting, intermittent feeding, but it's intermittent is the key where you're giving yourself a metabolic break. I see. And that's why we're shifting dinner a little earlier if we can, a little earlier if we can, so that there's this space between when you go to bed and when you eat, and then you have the whole night to just give your metabolism a break and let your body restore and, and recuperate. Got it. Someone asked a question on any thoughts on keto diet. We are going off the subject right now, but, um, but okay. I, well, one thing I would say is there's different ways of doing the keto diet. And what I often find is people who don't take it very seriously and really look at everything they're eating, they often then aren't on a keto diet. They're on a diet where they're eating lots of bad fats and then the rest of the stuff, and it ends up not being that healthy. The keto diet was really originally formulated for children with neurological disorders like epilepsy, nice. and it, it, it was helpful um, to those groups of people. And there is, there is a theoretical um, advantage. One of the things that all of these diets do is they get you from eating junk food because you're mm -hmm. focusing on eating other types of precise food. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that keto diet in a healthful way, I'm concerned that it could be potentially unhelpful. Yes. And I'm not saying you can't do it in a helpful yeah. way, but I would, I would think about it. For people who um, you know, really want to think about you know, the keto diet, Sarah Gottfried has a book that I think is helpful. Okay. Okay. Well, I ho hope that answered your question, whoever asked that question. Any other comments, any other feedback? Okay, well, if you can't think of any questions right now, you know how to DM us. Um, and we will be adding a lot of other, you know, like I talked about some of these uh, evidence, uh, you know, to our Insta account, and we'll be tagging Dr. Monty. So, um, so if you have any more questions, you're welcome to reach out to us. With that, uh, we'd like to wrap up this session. Thank you so much, Dr. Monty, for being with us. Thank you. Really and appreciate being here this morning. Yes, absolutely. And we would love to have you back whenever you have time. And we'll thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.